Hello, and thank you for joining us today for the intersectional in intersectional solidarity in animation telling BIPOC stories together panel, which is hosted by MPAC's Hollywood Bureau and Black Women Animate. I'm Sue Beatty, and I'm the director of MPAC's Hollywood Bureau. We work in the industry to change the narratives of Muslims so that audiences see how Muslims are vital contributors to creating social and cultural change in America and around the world. Black Women Animate is an animation house that creates and produces programming for broadcast, cable, streaming platforms, and live events. As a Black-owned studio, Black Women Animate build equity in animation, in, in the animation industry by consciously hiring Black women, women of color, and non-binary people of color. We will be hearing more about the incredible work of Black Women Animate shortly. On behalf of MPAC and Black Women Animate, I'd like to extend our gratitude to our friends at Sundance who helped make this panel a reality today. Thank you to Mary Sadegi, Melinda Garcia, Divya Coley, and Sydney Ritter. I promise you that today's panel and conversation is going to be rich and inspiring because animation is the future and intersectional storytelling is how authentic narratives happen. Today's panel is also going to be a dose of reality about how much work we have to do as underrepresented communities who really want to see narrative and cultural change happen. While panels at industry events like the Sundance Film Festival are great in giving exposure to creatives who are doing the heavy lifting and to organizations that are trying to help move the needle, real change is going to happen, happen when in institutions and decision makers walk the talk. In addition to supporting the work of highly talented creatives through labs and fellowships, when we talk about authentic representation for the BIPOC community, we expect that to be extended to authentic programming across the industry. We have organized a panel of industry professionals who between them have years of expertise in producing, storytelling, and advocacy. I'm so excited on behalf of MPAC and Black Women Animate to introduce our moderator today, Rokayat Giwa, who's an agent at the Creative Artists Agency, the top agency in the world, CAA. With that, take it away, Rokayat. Thank you, Sue. I'm so excited to be here today and to join the panelists as we discuss what you mentioned and to really get into this conversation with everyone. So first, I'm going to introduce Taylor K. Shaw. Taylor is a 2021 Forbes 30 Under 30 Hollywood and Entertainment List honoree and a 2021 Shadow and Act Rising Executive winner. As the youngest CEO in the animation industry, she founded BWA Studios, the first and only animation studio designed to change the world of animation by consciously hiring Black women and animators of color. As a creator and writer, she's committed to creating liberating narratives that allow Black women to discover more of who they are. Hey, Taylor. Next, I'm gonna introduce Priya Desai. Priya is the executive producer of commercial projects at BWA Studios. She has a long history in animated content for kids and family, as well as in documentary filmmaking and writing. Her passions are finding new talent, supporting their growth, and telling nuanced stories that we can all relate to. Hey, Priya. And last, but certainly not least, I'm gonna introduce Fatima Abdullah. Fatima is an animation and VFX producer who has spearheaded original and commercial production for Sesame Street, PBS Kids, and Nine Story Media. As an Atlanta native, she currently sits on the boards of the Atlanta Film Festival, ASIFA South, advocating for animators of all ages and backgrounds. Hey, Fatima. So thank you all panelists, but also all you out there on the Zoom for joining us today. I'm excited to be in this conversation with you all about intersectional solidarity in animation and how we can come together to tell stories from all people from historically marginalized and racial and ethnic groups. In setting the stage for this conversation, I want the audience to know that we will be centering these questions around the notions of intent versus impact and that yes, progress has been made, but we still have so far to go. We do not need these conversations and simply talk about how representation matters and thus overlook how decision makers may just be slotting, slotting us into the story and forget to analyze whether the story is even good. Additionally, we will not be looking at representation 
diversity and inclusion as a badge of honor, but rather as a piece of telling an entertaining story. So in Film Quarterly, Kristen J. Warner took a look at plastic representation, which is a way of describing how, because we are in, in, because we are in an area of representation matters, the images that come from this have artificial origins. While it can be easy to detect plastic representation in live action projects, where you hear people talking about how representation that includes people of color is an automatic success of hailing progress, or how colorblind casting is the best solution, or how slotting a non-white actor into a role that was not written for them in mind. In the animation space, it can look a little bit different and appear in a variety of ways. I'm curious to see how you all have seen plastic representation in the animated space and how it relates to our notion of discussing intent versus impact. And any of you all can start first. Woo, Rika Yad kicking starting us off with uh, plastic representation. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, firstly, I want to say you know, thank you so much, Impact, for partnering with us on this conversation. We are very excited to explore advancing equity in animation with you. Um, okay, so on the topic of plastic representation, um, you know, I believe one of the primary primary reasons it happens. Um, is because the infusion of non-white identities in these projects is often a belated inclusion. It's an afterthought. And that's true for the characters on screen and then who's voicing them or creating them behind the screen. Um, so, you know, there is so much that I appreciate and love about projects like Soul and Princess and the Frog. Honestly, they have moved me to tears. They made me believe in myself and my purpose. Um, my place in the animation industry. That is all very true. Um, and it's also true that there were blind spots in the production process on those projects that did lead to genuine oversight of key themes, key story themes, and production practices in animation that do further uh, systemic racial issues. So this is all really coming from the history of animation, which um, I, I would love to pass it over to Priya and Fatima to just even maybe talk more about that because the history, what we're coming from is a place of caricatures of uh, just really damaging racial stereotypes. Um, and so we're coming from that. And so, you know, now the bar is pretty low because we actually have not addressed that we have not set, and I mean, I think this is something that our country needs to do, but truth and reconciliation is just something that it has not happened for us as a, a country. So of course it's not happening in the animation industry um, and plastic representation, I think in animation is a result of that. I agree with you, Taylor, 100%. Uh, Priya, feel free to jump in. But when you think about the history of animation, it's, it's very closely tied to live action, right? It comes from the apparatus being designed for, for white bodies, white skin, and animation is modeled on, on some of the same practices. When we think about animation and our pipeline taking longer and sometimes being more expensive even than live action, it starts with a smaller group of people. It starts with character design, storytelling, all those things are happening at once. And then we bring in the department heads, which, you know, if you look at recent studies that have come out are already severely lacking. So when, it, when you think about how to avoid and get around plastic representation, um, it has to start at the very top when the story is being sold, ideated, when those designs are first happening. Um, for me personally, one of the ways I see this showing up in animation, of course, I grew up loving cartoons uh, despite its pitfalls, um, is uh, the, the animalistic representation of, of our stories. Uh, more often than not, we're represented as animals, right? You know, when we think about Princess and the Frog, again, Taylor, I was in there, tears with you. You know, she's on screen, Princess Tiana, 40 minutes. Uh, when I was looking it up just to get my head around it, 23 of those minutes are her as a frog. When we think about, you know, stories we love, The Lion King, again, beautiful representation of our culture. It's it's all animals, it's a cast of animals, right? So that's that's kind of the difference we're thinking about when it's animation and live action. I think one of the things uh, that plastic representation can be harmful for our culture and our stories. Um, I wanted to throw in there the idea of, um, you know, uh, characters and representation perhaps 
not being seen and only being heard or not being heard and being seen. And, you know, this issue of who voices stuff that we, that we see, um, in, in my community, in the South Asian American community, one of the oldest, you know, examples of this was a poo in the Simpsons. And it's a fraught example because just like you guys say, Princess Tiana brought you guys to tears. Like Princess Tiana brought me and my, my daughters to tears too. We cherish that story for a lot of reasons. Um, and, and Apu is fraught because I remember the time that he came out. He was actually one of the, you know, he was a character of honor on that show. He had, he had humanity. Um, everybody was just so happy to see him there. And that whole, that argument of um, we're just so happy we have the one thing. I think as a collective, we can think about how to get, get our industry past that. I think we can do better than, thank God I have one thing, because we know our stories are more nuanced than that. And ultimately it's on us to tell those nuanced stories. So, so I bring that up to say that we're Americans too. We're moved by these stories too. Um, we can be both, both happy about the fact that they exist and question the, the manner in which they exist and make them better. And I love that you brought up Apu because I think The Simpsons obviously like a very long running animated show, but you even see that these days with Big Mouth, Central Park, Family Guy, where it's just like still to this day, even though they course corrected after everything that's been going on the past two years, you still see to this day like it does not matter if you see someone of color on the screen, if someone behind it in the booth is not voicing them like that to us, it's just like very hollow. So I appreciate you bringing that aspect up. But then also in talking about plastic representation and how um, representation in the anime space can increase and always go further, it reminds me of conversations that I have with people where I explain like, yes, I'm definitely looking for more color in front and after the camera and behind the camera, but then they take a step back where I'm like, but we should also be talking about colorism and body diversity because yes, Sure, I want more Asian, sure, I want more Black people, sure, I want more Indigenous people, whatever it may be. But if I'm only seeing like people from all the fair skinned communities, if I'm only seeing the light skinned Black people and light skinned Asian people, if I'm only seeing white people of Latin descent, that to me is truly not representation. Or if I'm only seeing the skinny people or people without disabilities, like how is that truly true representation when it's like we have to be looking at everyone within our communities and making sure that they're included too? But I think those kind of things are very one step further for white people or one step further for more able-bodied people. But then you see things like Ursula and the Little Mermaid where she's more darker skin or whatever race she may be, but she's also fat and you see that in villains. I know obviously we can scream to the top of our lungs about how this can be changed, but what role do white people play in all this? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, well, you know, we could talk about this uh, for hours, um, but I think, you know, in the work of representation and addressing, uh, addressing the cultural layers like uh, colorism and then the layers of physical ability and beauty standards, um, all people grapple with that. Um, to address the question around what white people can do, what white people should do, what is their job, I think in the immediate, it's intentionally hiring um, and or working with more darker skinned folks, disabled folks, body diverse folks. Why? Because Eurocentric beauty standards are perpetuated in animation. Um, why is that? Well, we're all actually victims of those standards. Um, so, you know, that's the short term um, in my thinking. Um, two, though, for the long terms and starting now, white people should begin to question what they see as normal and beautiful. Um, and this is really everybody's work too. At BWA, we are hyper aware of colorism on our teams and in our content. I recognize that, um, I like to think I'm brown skin, but I am on the, maybe on the lighter side. Um, and so I recognize that as the founder and CEO of the company. So as, as I look at, okay, what kind of content are we making? We need to be centering dark skin girls and women. Um, so we have a kid's show that does just that. I have a live action show that has four girlfriend lead characters. One's brown skin, one's dark skin. I mean, there's so much more that can be done on that front. Um, but really in this conversation, um, I'm hoping what comes out of this panel is us coming together as non-white folks and asking how are we together erasing this idea that lighter skin is more beautiful, that is more worthy of the screen. Um, it's not true. And I think together as community, as non-white folks is something that we can work to change together. 
So well said. Um, looking at those standards, I love to think about the heroic body too. You know, what, what makes a heroic leader when you're thinking about an animated story? One easy story device that we've leaned on for way too long, right, is lighter color irises. You can see the window in the soul. They're more expressive for animators to use. It's way easier for a designer to have lighter, paler skin so we can show that blushing. We can see without saying it, right? So I think I challenge our artists too. How, and you know, the people who are commissioning the artist, how are we pushing ourselves in design as we're having conversations? What are those new storytelling devices that haven't been explored? You know, I have the privilege of working with such amazingly talented people. But we're also still working in these constrained, get it to the screen now timelines. It's going to take work to dismantle these beauty stand standards and the heroic standards that have been set up. Um, so I, I really think that it's about allowing the time to think about these and explore every facet of production uh, to break down the, those beauty standards, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to, I'll piggyback to say that, and we're all kind of saying the same thing, but hire us. Hire yes. us, put, those, put us in those rooms where we can challenge about iris color, where we can think about skin color. I mean, I'm, I'm hired as a cultural consultant on a lot of animation projects for kids um, that end up on all the big streamers and broadcasters we all put our children in front of. Yeah. And, um, and I... And, you know, I'm, con I, I am often asked to represent, <clears throat> I'm, I'm often asked to do this work because I am South Asian American, uh, for characters that are South Asian American, and any South Asian on this call will tell you that colorism is, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. I, we're right there at the front of the line on that problem. And like Taylor, <laughs> in my family, I, I am, I'm accused of being the lightest skin person in our house, um, when we are all up, you know, putting it up against there. But I always tell my daughter, it's like the brown is in my heart. Um, but um, all that is to say that that lived that those lived experiences have to come into the right rooms for any uh -huh. of the, for any of this work to happen. Those lived experiences have got to come into play <clears throat> at writers' rooms in development, not after, not after the thing's been pitched and greenlit, uh -huh. um, and and definitely well before well before production begins because that 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 production train especially in animation is just unrelenting and it's really hard to have these conversations um in the confines of those deadlines that that you know producers face so start way at the beginning start way at the beginning with all of your you know with the with your friends of color who have something to share and add to the conversation about how to make what we make the rainbow of the world that it is yeah, and to Priya's point, I think one thing that continues to happen, especially in animation, is the tokenization of uh, this layer that you're asking about, Rukaya, is just like, okay, what about skin color? What about differently able folks? It's like, okay, well, there's one kid in a wheelchair in this cartoon. There can't be two. We have mm -hmm. one, like they're in a friend group. It's not realistic or it shouldn't happen where there's two or there's one child with a medium build. Um, and so we don't need to include more. Like there's just one off scenario when the reality is in a friend group of kids, maybe they're all brown mm -hmm. dark skin. Why is that an issue? Why do we have to continue to perpetuate these way, these beauty standards? I love that you're saying specifically in animation, Fatima, the heroic standards. Why are we attributing certain physical features to, you know, having green eyes, having, why is that continuing when that is not the lived reality of our world? Yeah, right. And that, and that, um, I mean, I, my call before this call was with the streamer about something in development, and we were making the case that there should be two brown families in it, not just the main protagonist, <laughs> but the second one. Keep us posted. I know, I know, <laughs> I know, but what we were trying to communicate was the notion that there are so many other ways to look at the experience of being a brown family mm -hmm. and um, not to take this away from the from the colorism conversation that we're having but I think it's related we're going to see a spectrum as as we should so you know just to make the point that it's, it's happening every hour of every day and it's on us to bring it up Yes, and being counter stereotypical in those spectrums, you know, it's, it, you know, where we are right now, I think we really have to push against and, and that's I think the immediate for us is that to get away from that tokenism, 
the long term, I you know, it'll all play out. We'll have better stories, more representation behind and in front of. But right now, I think we have to be aggressive and pushing against stereotypes within that spectrum too. Yes, snap <laughs> and and the aggressiveness together. I think a really big part of us as BWA Impact wanting to come together in this conversation is to address together solidarity uh -huh. to do that um, internally um, pre and i j love and i our managing partner we're always talking about if you're the one person in the room you're the one person of color first of all for me it's like we're here what's up yeah. <laughs> and also like how are we just like pushing forward each other you know that per i'm not only looking out for black folks the mm -hmm. idea of black women anime is when black women rise we all rise and so that vision and mission like how do we all in our own way based on our lived experience push that forward because the reality is when an indian show or a muslim uh character center center show gets uplifted and greenlit that helps and supports all of us with Priya pushing for there being two brown families in the show in a show if that happens maybe we can do a whole neighborhood of brown people and this is why I say that the bar is so low um that it is sad and keeping it positive will keep pushing forward and like Fatima said being aggressive in that way and I like what you brought up about that because I think at times we we start to think of it as like a us versus them where it's mm -hmm. us versus white people or like black people versus like more representation for Asian people, whatever it may be. And I think like we can always also be thinking of what white people can be doing better. But I think it's also important to talk about like what are different ways that we can uplift our group, like how Taylor Fatima, how can we uplift Priya, like how can Priya uplift us? Because I think we think that we have to fight for our own individual representation where like, no, there is not food at the table, but there's space <laughs> at the table for every yes. single one of us. And yeah. I think it's just, and it also too, in terms of like the various races previous to what we mentioned, but it's like, yes, we want more non-white less animated characters, but is our call for representation intersectional? Like, are we also asking like, yes, we need people with disabilities represented on these animation screens. Like, even if I may not have a disability, I need to see that on TV because people, yes, want to see their self represent represented in stories, but it's also representative of the whole world. So it's like, how can we call for more representation in that space? And what can we do to uplift stories that are just not our own and make sure we're all seated at the table and looking out for each other? Such a great question. Um, for me, it's it's okay to say I don't know, right? You know, I've been in plenty of rooms where I'm the only, um, and teams where we're hired to maybe after the fact, as Taylor is saying, we're a handful in hundreds, um, and so you are called upon to answer fast questions on the day to day. And saying I don't know, let's reach out. I don't know, let's you know um, get some help on this. I think is part of the solution. And having these conversations helps us uncover our own intersection intersectionalities, right? Even within ourselves. So it, it brings to that broader spectrum um, how we are individuals. We're all individuals and have different lived experiences, um, but being okay and safe to say, I don't know and, and ask who you think does and uncover. Yeah, that is correct. And then also, as we're talking about the various forms of representation that can be presented, I hope that obviously creators of all races take as much care in finding the voice actors, similar to what mm -hmm. Priya mentioned with Apu or the various things about the current shows that are still going on today that may not be reflective of the characters that are on screen that mirror their characters' lived experiences. So it's like, yes, I love seeing the characters on screen, but I also want to hear someone that looks like them. And so what are some ways that we can ensure that whether it be creators, studio heads, network heads, et cetera, are not just checking a box saying that like, okay, we have a character on screen that may not be white, but has a little bit of tint to them on the screen and actually make meaningful changes. And also how can we hold them accountable? I think obviously there's Twitter, there's all these various things. I think you don't wanna like, be too nitpicky about things, but I think there's a there's ways in which we can fight back and say, yo, all these black people in the show are lighter than who knows what. And yes, that is representative of the world, but it's not representative of we know that you're just doing that because that's what you see is beautiful. Or that's what you see is just and what you see is right. So how can we hold people accountable and make sure like, yes, they're not just checking a box, but then continuing to do those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, really what comes to mind for me is us banding together. 
Um, every, I think a lot of people who are tuning in, uh, folks on this panel, know how to do the dance. You've been doing the dance because that's the only way you survive in this industry by doing the dance. Um, and so if you know how to do the dance and your colleague knows how to do the dance and y'all think something is wrong, messed up, like how can you figure out how to package, how to share, how to address something to said network, to said executive to say, hey, if we make these changes, we will avoid a lot of drama, these risks, we will avoid black Twitter. And it will also improve the quality scope and just reach of the animation, which I think gets lost a lot um, in how networks executives think about the work. Like Fatima said, it's all about timeline, production timeline, not, not losing time, not losing money. At the beginning, let's be supremely thoughtful, but the stuff does come up, these questions do come up. And so as they do, um, how do we as folks of color, non-white folks at said network, working with said executive, how do we band together um, and do our best to be a bit aggressive and push up against that door um, to see the kind of representation that, that we wanna see. And I think I'm opening a, a pretty big can of worms that is a a conversation, many, many conversations and many, many shared anecdotes of stories of how we've all done this in different ways. Um, but it is true that um, we can be accomplices, as we like to say at BWA as our managing partner, J Love likes, likes to say, we can be accomplices to each other. It doesn't just have to be a black thing or, um, mm -hmm. or, you know, or a Muslim thing or a Mexican thing, like let's really find our people within said organization and try to push forward together because multiple voices are stronger than one voice. That's right. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna jump in and just talk about a little bit, just the experience of, of being associated with Black Women Animate. I'm not Black, um, that's clear. <laughs> and I said, I made it very clear to Taylor. Um, <laughs> She said, do you want to come work with me? And, you know, but she, she explained to me the, the ethos of accomplice, like, she, and, and, and it's, I'm so sad J Love isn't here to be able to talk about it herself. Cause she really speaks to it so poignantly um, that, you know, this is an intra-community problem or this is an intra-community challenge. I mean, it's not a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a challenge to solve. And the, the idea is that any one of us at any moment in our time, in our professional time, in our careers, we'll have seats at some table. We may be the only, but we're gonna have a seat at the table. And what are you gonna do with that seat? What are you gonna do with that power? And you know, each of us has the responsibility, of course, to do our own work and see ourselves succeed and get our things made and all the stuff that will happen. But I think we also, need to collectively take it upon ourselves not to give in to the scarcity model, like not to give in to the idea that it can only be me. Um, because it, can, it doesn't need to be me. I can't tell the story that Taylor can tell and I can't tell the story Fatima can tell, but I can get, I can tell my friends at the table with me that there's a Fatima and there's a Taylor and they have something to say. And that's not taking anything away from my opportunity. So when I hear of collective action, like that's what I think of. When I think of my seat at the table and my relative privilege over black, you know, over the uh, over the um, condition of, of of black women in our in our um, in our professional community, that's what I would do with that opportunity. I'll take it even a step further and take it away from the sort of black white thing. You know, I'm constantly as a um, an Indian American. There is, you know. South Asian is almost turning into a euphemism for 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 Indian for what they mean by like kind of like majority Hindu Indian American and there are so many expressions of South Asian um but they're not all at the table and if I am and I have the opportunity to bring on another voice from you know the larger South Asian American community or the diaspora and I think it's appropriate I'll say something and I've done that. And it has never, I have to say, it's never taken away from my own opportunities. If anything, it has given people the notion that, oh, that girl Priya, she's gonna be thinking broadly about how to make something better. So all like as, as hard as frustrating as it can be, let's look at these things as opportunities for <laughs> all each other. Um, because it, I think the universe works in such a way that it comes around. I, I do think that, and I have to believe that. And, and truly to uplift um, 
what Priya just said in her work. Um, BWA, um, Priya is an executive producer at the company. Jayla Calderon is a white woman and a manage and the managing partner of the com company. Um, and BWA came from me as a young black woman being like, oh, I'm gonna make a show and not being able to find one black female animator. I knew nothing about animation. I can barely draw, um, but I had this vision that, hey, if I have a show, why, why would black women not be able to animate it? Priya has so much experience in the animation industry. J-Love has so much experience in entertainment. And for them as folks who are not black, um, people who are not black women, they will never know my lived experience, but they really took the time to know my heart, to know my mind, understand my vision, and then uplift that to create what we have today, a fully fledged studio. And yeah, I could have potentially, you know, done it on my own, but, but why is that necessary? Why does it have to happen in that way? If we can come together, as I was saying, band together and uplift one person's vision, it does not take away from all of the original content that Priya has on her own slate. It really creates an opportunity for more visibility for us to better leverage um, our, that one person's access. And I think it's about, um, as J-Love says, the collaborative economy. It's about all of us really recognizing that abundance, Rudukayat, you're saying abundance, the table is full and plentiful. When we are crabs in a barrel, um, it really stops us from advancing animation and the entertainment industry in a way that, um, in the ways that we can. And I also think like it could be a multi-pronged approach because I think there are some people that like to work within a system and some people that like to work without it independently, you know, to like, I'm someone, I like the office, I like working the system, I work at CAA. <laughs> and even, and like, you need people like surrounding it in all efforts, you know what I mean? I think like a lot of people want to do it independently, but it's like, no, you need someone in the studio office to help support your vision. Like even at CAA, we have a group called the Cultural Packing Union Group and we meet once a week. And it's not only just people who look like us in the group, but we also have white people in the group and our, we're just truly there trying to figure out how can we package whatever, whether it be TV shows, movies, ideas that our clients have that are representative of the world. And even I think yesterday, we just had like a very frank conversation, like what does representation look like? Like, yes, even though it's on the whole entire company and the company does do that to make sure like our products that our clients do are representative, we're like, okay, we need a particular space that, yes, we are not excluding other people from the space because anyone can join and come in and give their ideas. But it's like, we need a space where we can focus on these projects and give them the, the care they need. And then also like learn from each other. Like, even though, yes, we have some level of how we can be appropriate in our representation. We also had a presentation from our colleagues of Asian descent about highlighting our Asian clients. We also had a presentation that highlighted our indigenous clients because it's like, I have so much to learn about what the correct terms are, what clients we need to know and so forth and so on. So I think like when you work in a collaborative manner, not only within the system, but outside the system and work like hands across the table, it creates such a more better system in my opinion. So it's like, that's why I love how you all, I don't know if you all would consider yourself independent, but I think working outside the system, I love how that's there because it's just like, we can't only have people like me behind the computer at the desk doing this and that. And then I guess um, moving on to the next one, I think it's great to think about obviously these structural changes, like I mentioned, like ESCA might have this, maybe other agencies might have that, different studios and networks have their own, I don't wanna say diversity initiatives because sometimes it feels like its own separate silo in a sense. But I also think that like, yes, we can shame people or raise questions or whatever it may be. But I think a lot of this thing has to do also with behavioral mindset changes that comes with them because you could hear like, the most well-meaning person who says the wrong thing or who looks at representation the wrong way, but then at the end of the day wants to say, like, no, I have a black friend, whatever it may be. But it's just like, how do you make sure that like you are, I don't want to say changing people's behavioral mindset, but equipping them to think in a way that's more forward thinking, like, yes, we want more color on screen, but like we mentioned, let's look at colorism, let's look at body diversity, let's look at different ways that people um, represent their body in terms of whether they're disabled or whether they're not, or whatever that looks like in the in-between. Because I feel like if I have to hear how white writers and voice actors talk about how hard it is to be a white person in the industry, I'm going to lose it because it's not the case because there's just so much further that we as a community, because we're all one big community here, can go further. So what can we do be holding 
each other accountable for our own personal biases, whether it's within our community that's not white, but also outside at large in Hollywood as well. And also people add questions in the Q&A and we'll get to those after. Fatima, did you wanna kick us off? Sure, I'll give it a shot. That's such a good question. Um, accountability. I, you know, I like to pull examples from me working in the kids space and really reminding, coming up with a simple message to remind people and pull them back to the mission, right? It's, it's yes, and I hear you. Here's how we can do that and offer a solution and keep repeating it if you have to. I mean, sometimes I feel like a broken record when I'm at the office working in the studio. I've also done independent um, tech and animation before. And I think it is that dialogue that you're saying that here's how here that's done outside the box. Maybe we can incorporate this. I love how a lot of companies are doing labs and intensive groups like you're talking about Rukayat where it is a specific designated space. Um, but I do think that message has to be constantly flagged and, and, and examples given, especially as it relates to the exact story you're telling. So taking it out of the philosophical mindset and turning it into a practical what story are you trying to tell? Let's let's get a very specific example of how your entire production team can take this to the road. And I also like how you mentioned the various labs that companies do, but I think, because I think, yes, they're seen as a badge of honor of the quote unquote diversity workshops, but I think it's just, I, this can be a whole other conversation, but it just seems like more hurdles that we have to tick boxes to say like, yes, I've done this lab, I've done this thing, when it's just like, just give the person the shot and let them do what they need to do. But sorry, Priya, go. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> um, I don't even have anything else to say about that. But um, I just wanted to add to, to Fatima's, I, Rukayat, as you were asking the question, my thought was, tell them stories. I mean, we're all here because we love stories. Even those executives are there because they love stories. That's where they started. And my feeling is, at the end of the day, the thing that our superpower is that we tell stories about human beings. And I think that Anything, any story we are trying to push out into the world and get made, sold, is based on something that we or somebody close to us lived, experienced, ha has some connection to. And I think that those of us who get the privilege of being in the room to talk about it have to do the work of understanding those stories, as Taylor mentioned, and being able to say, this is what I know about it. This is why I care about it. This is what I don't know about it because it isn't my lived experience, but bring Taylor in and she'll tell you all about it. You know, again, it's like, it's just this confluence of all the things we've been talking about in this last hour of, of solidarity, understanding, listening, you know, intra-community work and, um, and then tell, tell, tell an honest story. Is it always gonna work? No, of course it's not always gonna work, but, you will walk out of that room knowing that you told the truth one way or the other. And I think there's power in that. Um, the lab thing is, I'm, I'm just gonna jump to the lab question um, because it's interesting to me because I have in the course of my career been asked to put things like that together. Um, and I think the most successful ones are the ones that just give people a shot where the production takes the quote unquote risk. I like to use the word investment instead of risk they make the investment on emerging talent. Um, often that talent is talent of color. And the investment means hire them to write a real script, like give them a script fee, get them the credit so they can put it on IMDB. You might have to, re you might have to, you might have to edit it five times instead of three, but build it into your production model that X number of scripts are gonna get written that way. And then set it up so that it works. I know this works because I've done it. So um, there are ways, there are ways that you can let people into the room and give them agency to do more than just observe, but actually to contribute. And um, starting careers off on that foot is what builds the confidence to then go out there and, and tell your own story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah I was looking at another question in the chat. <laughs> I was say, I got the chat full of questions when we're ready to. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, is the hypothetically speaking, how do we stay true to our stories if someone on our team, on our team pushes against having too many people of color in lead roles? Um, I feel like that's a, a good one to address. Um, and I think it goes back to Ruka Yat's question of 
How do we hold folks accountable? Um, and with this question, I think um, just pairing those questions together, um, self-awareness is key. Um, self-awareness for people in entertainment um, specifically as we talk about animation and how far behind it is, how much it needs to advance. Um, but self-awareness for all of us um, and for our white counterparts, really thinking about, okay, you are in a position of privilege and true access in say animation. And so if you're being self-aware, cause I don't think the onus is necessarily on us to be like, oh, wow, you're being problematic. Oh, wow. Like self-awareness of saying, okay, let me look at myself what do I think is beautiful? Do I think I'm beautiful? From that, what kind of characters am I drawn to make? Okay, did I grow up in a homophobic, fat phobic um, environment? Did, did I know any black people pre me being 21 years old? How did that impact me? Um, because then when we ask ourselves this question of how do we stay true to our stories if someone on our team pushes about having too many people of color, do you did you actually take the time to get to know those people and look at them as three dimensional humans instead of just saying this is a black person because who did that black person train under it doesn't even matter who they trained under but what like who are they as a 3d person multi-dimensional human and what are they bringing to the project because i am not fatima and we have very different lived experiences i am not rukayat and we have different experiences and we all bring something different to the table. Um, and so I think when you're posed with that question of, oh, there's too many people of color is like, these are all individual humans who have different experiences and have different skills, gifts and talents that they bring to said project. And that's why they're there. They're not here to just check a box. And that framing is the issue. So if you are gonna help people be more accountable, say, hey, you know, I just invite you to look at how you're framing this. Um, and, and then maybe you wanna ask yourself more, become more self-aware of why you think it's an issue that there's three, I'm sure it's no more than three um, black people or Muslim folks like on this project. And even with that, I'm always reminded of, um, from Lori's question, thank you, Lori, um, something that my friend Noni would always tell me in terms of like the law of averages. She used to work in McKenzie and I think at probably every year there was classes of white people, but then one year there might have been an overabundance of folks of color. And it's and then I think it's like it's fine if you have an overabundance of people one year because it's just or not one year or one project because if you're thinking that one more person or one more person of color is going to be like oh this is going to change what the project is looking like why did you never think about that when it's ten white people and one black person or ten white people and one Asian person it's like. I don't want to say we have to course correct for past years of being shut out of whatever it is the animation or live action industry, but you also have to think of it like what's your issue because you didn't have an issue yesterday when it was 10 white people on this project, why do you have an issue now when we're just trying to add one more person. And I think maybe as I'm growing older it's just asking those kind of questions It's just like answer that for me before I answer why I need more people on this project that are of color. But um, okay so we're going to get to more. I just want to say oh. I love, love that. <laughs> Okay, so it's the soldier. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> no, when she told me about the law of averages, I was like, okay, I'm going to start using that. So I, I, I love that that question. But okay, so we're going to get to more of the um, audience questions. I'm going to be looking down my phone. Next one is for Ali Abbas. Do you usually have educational material ready to go for mixed crews where you might have to spend a good deal of time and money to help non POC unlearn techniques around physical or cultural representation? Fatima, I feel like you're just in the trenches, girl. You got <laughs> I think the data is out there. And I, if, if, I think we should also put the two studies that we were looking at in this panel in the chat if we can. Um, and that's kind of part of the lab conversation, I feel like. So those uh, educational touch points are, are there, they're ready. Um, it does add a little bit to your day, right? It adds those extra hours onto getting it done. So I do think it's the responsibility of the studio, the company to try to incorporate those extra rounds Priya's talking about when an average of three rounds to get something through and you're trying to educate your team on those daily challenges, just anticipate five or six. I haven't seen a production time like that yet outside the lab environment. So I think that is, that's how we kind of keep that education going on down the line because it doesn't stop at the top. It, it has to go down to people who are making the decisions for the production every day. 
I can just add one lived experience to this. Yeah. Um, I was involved on an animation production that is um, is on PBS Kids right now. It's called Molly of Denali. It was an animated television. It's an it is an animated television series that is um, centered on the in a Native Alaskan community. So it's really the first animated television series about Alaska Natives anywhere, and it centers on a little girl named Molly, and um, it's such a particular microculture of a culture. So thankfully, we, you know, the producers were very aware of that. We did not have enough um, writing talent from the community. So we created a writing fellowship and it was my job to create that. And essentially that was to get Alaska Native writers involved in the production. We ended up selecting six folks who had never written for television, never written for animation, maybe had tried their hand at a screenplay, maybe they were poets, but we saw the spark of storytelling. And to be able, and, and, and by the way, we, we paid all of them to write their script. They got, they got, you know, they got union rate script fees and all of them, except one, ended up in the writer's room for season two. And, um, but along the way, what I, what I built into the system is a parallel track to actual production. They had their own head writer who we hired and paid because we had to raise money for this. And they were on their own track of how they were going to learn to write a script and write a script. All six of the scripts, by the way, got made into television shows. They all have a real credit and they're going to go on and write other things now. So, but that was the work. I had to get hired to do that. I had to, had to, have, I had to be somebody who had the awareness to think about all those things. I had to have enough production experience to understand that I couldn't be messing with production in a, you know, in a demonstrative way because that had to keep going. And then we had to build this thing and it wasn't perfect, but we, we built it. So, um, and there's no question that the money for this stuff is there. Whenever, when anybody tells you it's like a budget problem, it's just a budget problem in terms of the current budget. All you've, you've got to go find more money, <laughs> but, um, but we all know that money's there in lots of different places. And it may as well go to something like this instead of yet another, you know, DEI something, something, which are awesome. I do those, I've been involved in those too, but you know, I'm just saying, let's give people some jobs. So I just wanna say that it exists. The model exists, it's not perfect. It can be improved, but with time, appropriate resource and money, it can, it can be done. Yes, thank you. And Priya, I think the next question might be really to you, or how does someone become a cultural consultant on animation projects? Also, I'm gonna drop a link to a program that CA does through the foundation group that's called Full Story Initiative, that's designed to generate more authentic stories and it has programming and materials there for people to check out, but Priya. Yeah, yeah that's a great program. Um, how do you become a, you get old. <laughs> Um, you, you get, you work in this thing for a long time. And um, my trajectory was that I worked at GB, at WGBH here in Boston, where I lived for a long time. I produced and directed a lot of, you know, a lot of animated TV shows and worked in all parts of kid shows. And then I left there to go work independently, which is how I met Taylor. Um, but it's essentially a side hustle. I mean, I think I've put myself out there as somebody who cares really deeply about this work in, in the animation community and in the kids content community. And my network knows that about me. And so, you know, folks have started calling about this kind of work specifically. So it could be a production that has um, a, an, a South Asian character in it and they want a little more specificity around how to characterize that, that character. It could be that they're in pre-production, but they're thinking about their equity goals for the production way from the start. And I'm on a committee. Um, it plays out in a lot of different ways. Um, but I, I have to say that I just, in going independent, and this gets to Rekai out what you were saying about, you know, some of us need to be in the office and some of us need to be outside the office. Um, in going independent, I made the decision to wear this passion on my sleeve and put it out there as something I do and offer our community. Yeah, and with that, you manifested all of the work that you're doing now. And I think that's um, really important for all of us as uh, creatives and community together is to let our, our people know what it is that we want to do um, and to find ways that we can support our people. And from there, you know, I think more can be possible. Thank you. And then the next question is from Adana Ebo. 
What is the most effective way to push networks and studios to hire a POC showrunner for an animated show, especially because people rely so heavily on experience and realistically POC and animation haven't been given as much opportunity in order to have that required experience. My first thought is to shame them, but I know it's very hard to do. It's, I mean, you all can answer, but it's even from me on the agency side, it is very hard to do. It's just, it's very demoralizing, but you all feel free to answer. Sorry, I just wanted to post that study up. When we're talking about shaming, let them see the data, right? I think, I think it's part of that constant communication. When studies like this are coming out, share it broadly, share it widely. You can't deny these numbers. So, you know, Priya, I love that um, story you just told us with the, with the parallel track, those models exist and that they're out there and being able to communicate those to your hiring executives. Um, it's challenging because things get done they get made so quickly, um, but I think if we're constantly talking to our studio leads, our reps, if we're in the office or sending these around our communities, um, hopefully that kind of drives that, that motivation to hire and take risks or invest, um, as Priya has taught us, um, in, the, in the talent that needs to come in and get the experience. And then also outside of shaming, we also do this thing called, I think, um, the CA Multicultural Roadshow. And I think it sucks that we have to do something like this, but as you know, the kind of industry that we work in, where we highlight people who are just like on the cusp of being like the next thing, whether it's like the next quote unquote hot writer, hot director, hot showrunner. So I think it's telling people like, yes, here are some ideas that you may have for showrunners, but it's like, here are some people of color who may not have show any experience, but like, if you look at their resume, they have like, just get, yeah. this can be the next show running thing because I understand that like, there's ways on the writer's side that you have to start from staff writer story editor, so forth and so on and have those credits. But it's just like, you never know if that next co-producer could actually show run your show and make it successful. I think it's thinking, and I'm not saying lower the bar, but it's thinking outside the box where it's like, yeah hey, I know we may not have been able to find a long list of showrunners of color, but here is someone who's that supervising producer or producer who can definitely handle this show. And we are here to support them in doing this. Yeah, I think I think those of us who have built our communities intentionally that way to know those folks, um, we know who can do it. And I think, again, it's on each other to, to push for it. Um, I think we've all probably been in situations where we've done it in the past where I've said, you may not be on her resume, but I know yeah. she, can. you know, I, I, you, you got to stand up for people and get them in the room. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think it's also worth offering the suggestion of what we do at BWA, we hire a ton of emerging talent um, and we pair them with um, our AD. We pair them with uh, veteran folks who can uplift them and help them do the work. Um, and so I think it's worth making that recommendation. Like, Hey, can we just hire a mentor for, for them, at least get them some type of like training that makes you feel good about it. Um, either while they're on set um, or, or, or while they're in the writer's room for a showrunner or, you know, what can we do to sh give this person a little extra support? Cause I deeply believe and advocate for this person and I know that they can do it. So with just this little bit of support, I think it'll take them over the edge. Um, and, and I just want to say that this is also hard because we know many a white guy who had no idea what he was doing, got the job and was, it was very successful. And so can, can we just, can that just change? I just want to put that out there. Oh, that is real. And then our next question is from Aisha Hussein. I would love to, I would love to ask if the panelists have experience in being considered slash assumed to be the diversity hire and how they navigate those conversations. Understanding that people considered white don't have the stigma of being considered homogeneous, <laughs> I can't say the word homogeneity hires. Some of us are pushing through in spaces where others have not been pushing, would love some insight on how to keep pushing. So it's two questions. Yes, I can out. Yeah, but yeah, so it's just like how your experience, if you may have had it in terms of being a diversity hire and how do you navigate those conversations? <laughs> um, you know, VW, our studio, you, sh you know what you're going to get, Black women animating. So why do people come to us? Because they want Black women animating. Some people want to genuinely want to create stories and tell stories with us. Some people want to be able to say our huge company that's doing all the things wrong is hiring Black women 
to animate something. Um, and so, you know, honestly, I'm just very frank in those conversations and our team is always looking out and hyper vigilant of that because what you don't want is someone leveraging your name, what you all do, you know, who you are for, to be their poster child, um, which I was on many of a, a high school and college brochure. So like, we wanna, we wanna shift that. So I think just being honest in the conversation is very key and just saying, hey, I wanna make sure that this is not plastic representation. I wanna make sure that you're seeing me as a whole person and that you know that this is what we do and this is what we're about. Um, that's what we do. I don't know, Priya, if you wanna speak more to that because that's especially true for us on the commercial side. Yeah, no, I think, I think we are, I think we are frank. I think we're elegant about it. I think that we say, how did you come to find us? Why do you want to work with us? There's so many amazing animation studios. I mean, we're, we're elegant about it, but I think it's, it's just part of the ethos of BWA that we want to work from the truth with all of our partners. And, um, and we're not naive about the work that comes our way. I think we understand exactly what's going on, but I think um, we can turn them into opportunities. Um, you know, we can turn, we, we turn them into opportunities because we're that good. Um, so not to sound crazy, but you know, we're pretty good. Um, I'm trying to think of my own kind of like lived experience. Funny enough, like my first, the internship I had in college that got me my first job out of college, which actually truth be told was not in television or film. It was actually in magazines, but it was out of a diversity internship that NYU did. I, I applied for it as a non NYU student and I got in and a, a big magazine hired me and then gave me my first job in media. And um, it was, it was, it was funny because I was actually the only non-black person in that entire internship. Um, but I, I think back on it now and I think, oh, maybe, maybe that got me my foot in the door, but you know, I'm, I'm also the only intern that got hired. The, the magazine told me I was the only intern they ever hired after an internship. So I think opportunities exist for a reason. Again, it's on you to make the most of it. And I think a way to navigate if someone does question or brings up the state of being a diversity hire, I think it's just to interrogate them and why they think that just because there's someone non-white, whatever race they may be, that it's something out of the ordinary. Because I think when you start to ask people about that and say like, okay, so you do consider white the standard and you do think that white is the excellence and that if a white person did not get this job, that something must be wrong with the whole entire system. When well, you didn't think something was wrong with the whole entire system when it was all white people. So I think when you start to ask them in a more logical way that's maybe combative not combative that could be a way but is always how I um, think of it so our next question is from Ashley Alexander where is the boundary or is there a boundary when the intent is specific representation of one group but the pressure to not be deemed exclusive puts the initial group to the side and the intended conversation to instead prioritize the comfortability of the guest viewers to the conversation how much time does it take or will it take for them to finally be a neighborhood of possible pos positive and realistic representation without this societal pushback. If I'm understanding the question correctly, I think it's when there is specific um, representation of specific groups. I think if I'm understanding that correctly, I just think it's just like, yes, personally for me, I want all people represented in stories and medias and film, TV, whatever it may be, but that not every single project has to have everyone representative in it, if that makes sense. Like, I'm not saying it's okay to like some, well, sometimes it's okay to have an all white show of people living in South Dakota in this small town, because that might be the, the, the population there and adding a black person would not make sense. You know what I mean? But it's just like, where does representation make sense in these stories is how I think about it. It's just like, you, you should see yourself represented in film and TV at large, but I don't think that you have to see yourself represented to align with the story, but you all feel free to answer if I understood the question correctly. Yeah, I agree. I think it goes back to our conversation about telling stories from truth, right? You, we've all heard, tell the story you know, tell the story that's in your heart. Um, so regardless of maybe where you are, what your regional background is, um, it is really about 
um, seeking out stories that you want to be a part of, right? There are leaders in the creative community who, if you want to get on board um, a BIPOC story, go find them, get out of the way and let them do it versus trying to tell that story for them. Uh, but, but if I'm understanding correctly, yeah, it is, I agree with you, Rukayat. It's not never necessarily every story has to be um, representative, representative of every single angle. Can it be truthfully? But what stories can be um, and make sure they're being told by the right people. Mm -hmm. And I would only add that we you go back to kind of storytelling 101, like when when developing something, whether it's animation or live action or anything yeah. else, we're just trying to tell a great story. And every element of that story has to be there for a reason. Um, every character, every background you think about or location that you think about, every, you know, everything has to move the story forward. And that I think includes the representation in the story. It should make the story forward. It should make the story better. Whatever that story is that you're telling, it should make it, it should elevate it and lift it up in some way. So um, I would think critically about it the way I think critically about whether, you know, a character was born in America or not born in America. It's usually important and impactful and it changes the entire scope of what you're trying to do. Yeah. And then the next question, more positive and light from Mia. Are there any current productions the panelists can talk about that they think are really hitting the various topics they're um, talking about in terms of representation and equity? I'm gonna throw Karma out there. Um, preschool animated series from Nine Story Media. It's on Netflix, check it out, binge it. Um, created by Chris Bridges, I know him as Luda, he's down here in Atlanta with me. Um, I think that story in a way is, is doing everything I love about animation. It's pressing forward on the pipelines, pressing forward on colorism and, and, and high-end animation. Um, I know there are things in the pipeline we can't quite talk about yet, but that's the one that comes to mind for me. Um, I already mentioned Molly of Denali. Mm -hmm. But I would also put Alma's Way out there. I think there was some very yes. intentional work done on Alma's Way, which is um, for all of you Sesame Street friends, Maria, <laughs> Sonia Manzano. Yes. It's her, it's her brainchild, and it's an a lovely animated series set in her own community and neighborhood in New York. And uh, oh, sorry, Taylor. I was just going to say, I really appreciate you all offering those um, examples in the children's space because I think in the children's space, it's being done. Um, more and, and, and a lot more intentionally. Um, I really want to see us push more in the adult space mm -hmm. for more content um, in adult animation that is either created by or centering, um, uh, you know, Black folks or folks of color. There have been a few, I think, like there was an anime show that um hit uh netflix um but there's there's more to do and so i just hope that a lot of people that are tuning in have ideas that they're pursuing and looking to pitch and collaborate with other folks on um i know we at bwa have quite a bit of ip that we uh, on kids and on the adult side that we want to see out there so i i find my a lot of my inspiration from the the creatives that I know that are making stuff because unfortunately I think there's only like a few things that we can pick from and to your point Rukayat about okay you know if we're talking about girls maybe one of the characters didn't need to be black well I really don't care they can do they can do what else that's Lena's girls <laughs> have it I just want to see you know a show that has a cast of Indian girls of Mexican girls of um, like that's what I want to see. And so that's what I hope we see more of just more green lights. Um, cause I'm inspired by this diverse content, um, that is in the works. And see them embraced as American stories. I think that's yes. my, like, that's my thing. Like, <laughs> see them embraced for the, the American stories that they are. It is the beauty of where we live. I know it also makes it complicated, but it is the absolute gorgeous beauty of where they live that you can go home and have a cultural life and you can be outside and bring that cultural life with you and also be, a living, breathing, voting American. Um, it's what makes us who we are. It sounds really cheesy, but it's really <laughs> true. And the older I get, the more I believe it. <laughs> yes. Okay. So next question is from Nadia. 
What do you look for from producer partners slash distribution platforms when the execs are white, but we're looking for cultural understanding and nuance around our stories? What to look for in the right partners essentially who are not POC when developing POC stories? You know, I don't think that everybody's gonna get it, but I think the trying um, and the care is something that I look for. Um, I, as a creative and as uh, somebody that has a studio, um, I think we as a team are not afraid to say no. And now we have this wonderful thing that is the internet and you can make your stuff and just post it on the internet. And so I think uh, for us as creatives too, you know, it's great to be on linear. It is great to be on streaming platform platforms and networks. And you also can, if they don't get it, you can cultivate your own audience, make your stuff, do that. And then when they do get it, the price is higher. So, you know, I think seeing who who will try because the reality is that most executives and most networks are mostly white, um, but who's gonna try, who's gonna give you the space, um, who's hiring like a Priya as a cultural consultant to support on your project and allow it to be what you envision. Of course, everything's a collaboration, um, but I think just a key part of this, the story for you is like not being afraid to say no, not being afraid to wait for the right time because every partner is not going, every person that says they wanna partner with you is not gonna be right and I think that's okay. Um, so yeah, I'm curious to hear what, what you ladies think, um, but I'm, uh, I'm very into putting your head down, doing the work and playing the long game because that's, I would much rather do that than compromise on, you know, the content and what my dream of what it can do for representation. I agree. <laughs> you said it well. <laughs> okay, so the next one is beyond the argument for on, or the second to last um, Q&A question, beyond the argument for on screen representation to reflect the world we're in, do you ever find yourself also making the business argument about the money being left on the table when you only cater to white audiences, e.g. the blacklist and McKenzie study showing 10 billion box office dollars being missed out by not having more black led projects? Yeah, I, I was trying not to go there and make this a money conversation, but the audiences that are opened up when we tell intersectional stories and are really pushing haven't been even tapped yet and uncovered. There's such potential. And when you tell richer stories, and especially with our young kids talking about the preschool audience that evolves every single year, they're growing up in an environment in the real world, and that's what they're going to look for. You know, that long game you're playing for them. We have to learn how to tell their stories and tell them with them. Um, so yes, I think there is money left on this table, the future table. It, if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense, right? That's what our executives tell us, but that's, you know, maybe sometimes a language you have to use. And then we have one for Diara. About what I said about youth representation where it makes sense, I'd be interested to hear the panel's thoughts around the Black Ariel, the uh, mermaid story debate and how people were complaining because of her assumed cultural background. I think this is relevant for animation. So what advice would you give to navigate all the criticism as we are making more and more remakes? That's a big question. <laughs> a lot of people have feels about um, the new Ariel and, and whenever a character is reinvented for reinvention's sake. Um, bravo on the casting, right? I think that, you know, they, they made a decision there. Um, I don't know where the project is in development, but I think all that work we're talking about has to be done to lift that character up and talk about why her story makes sense. Yes, we're seeing such a world of remakes and it is, it is problematic when you're just resurfacing something of the past with past apparatus and you know facing it differently. So I think that's one of the toughest questions that the big five animation have to deal with as they're developing new stories. And I think also too, in terms of that, I think, cause I think it might be live action, but it's just like making sure they're not just slotting a black Ariel and maybe mm -hmm. changing some of the storylines. I think even, was it Peter Dinklage? I forgot the actor's name yesterday about Snow White and the yes. remake of that and what that looks like for representations. Like, yes, you can have progress by having a Latina as Snow White, but it's like, what, what, do, what are you gonna do about the seven dwarves or what's the title gonna be or what does that look like? So I think mm -hmm. when you're reimagining things and making them more current, making sure that it makes sense and everything around it too as well. 
Yeah. Yeah. The universe has to change. Mm -hmm. That universe was very, um, it was made for like uh, with a white lens. Um, Mm -hmm. So when you make these adjustments, um, uh, Peter Dinklage, I'm so happy that he spoke out around, uh, you know, his representation of people that um, share lived his same lived experience as well, because um, the whole universe, the whole story has to change to be more progressive, to be less problematic, to encompass the fullness of, in this case, Ariel, her as a three-dimensional human, as a Black girl with dreads. And so, you know, um, it's not easy to do. I mean, maybe they should green light more stories <laughs> that are new. Um, so, so yeah, it's a really great, really great question. I think we could keep talking about. <laughs> yeah. And then does BWA have any planned workshops, classes, or meetups? Oh, I would love to be in person. We would all love to be in person. Um, we did have a, a big um, annual event, our uh, boot camp, and we started doing a Black and Animation Award show. And so our hope is for 2023 um, that we can be in person again. Um, but please, you know, you can follow us on socials at BWA Studios underscore, and we do um, update anything that we're doing there. But thanks for asking. And yeah, we do want to be more in community. So hopefully we can all be doing this panel or something similar to it next year um, at Sundance together. Perfect. And I know we covered a lot of stuff and it's only the tip of the iceberg. But before we um, close out, just wanted to see if there was anything that you all did not get a chance to say on this topic. I know, very heavy question, but as we wrap up with everything. No, we're good. Okay. Or, um, yeah, I was or, just, just going to say a non heavy thing, which is that <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful to be with these ladies, with you, Rukaya, Tsu, Mona an impact, but um, I'm, I'm, I, I think it, it means a lot when we all come together and talk about this stuff together. So thank you for that opportunity. It really does. Um, yeah, I wanna say just thank you to everyone for who you be. Um, Jayla Calderon, our, our founding and managing partner at BWA, she's so sad that she wasn't able to be here today um, due to being sick, um, but her call to action uh, for this panel is for white people to take daily accountable action um, and that is coming from her as a white woman and accomplice um, and I think to close out I'd like to say um, as community as non-majority folks in the animation space um, let's really try to hold an empowered frame and how we shift what's possible in the animation space I think uh, for me and why I wanted to ent- enter this space is that animation signifies and is a place for folks to dream Um, And so I really talk about a lot about the invitation to dream and who is who is invited to do that. Um, And I hope that together and continue to band together, build together, follow up with each other um, after this panel that we're able to expand uh, who is invited to that dream and that that really includes all of us. For sure. And before we leave, I do want to note that Impact Hollywood's Bureau is extending the deadline to their $10,000 grant or earmarked for Black film, Muslim filmmakers. It also was done in um, partnership with the Full Story Initiative that I mentioned earlier in the chat. The deadline extended for March 31st, but check out their website to apply. And then also, obviously, on behalf of Impact's Hollywood Bureau and Black Women Anime, I just want to say thank you for all who tuned in today. And we don't want this conversation to just end here, and there's no way to end here, but just want to make that clear. So we urge you all to bring up these topics, whether you work in the anime space or live action space, because as we're pushing for more representation for all people, like not just representative of color, like we said, but just literally all people within those groups. We just want to make sure that we're doing it in partnership in a way that makes sense and is accountable for everyone. I think we are it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you all for joining today.